Okay, in this lecture, uh, we're going to look at a couple applications of the friction we just previous talked about. The first one that we're going to look at is a wedge. And what a wedge is, is it's basically, it's, it's a machine, okay, and what it does is it transforms a small force into a large force and kind of turns an angle, generally a right angle. So what I have here is I have my wedge under here, and I push on it with a P, and what happens is that wedge slides to the right, pushing up on the load. Okay, um, so again, it generally takes a small force to, cr to, to move this load up just a little bit, this large load. So it's taking a horizontal force and basically creating a large vertical force. Okay, now in order to deal with these and solve them and figure them out, um, I basically treat them as a machine. So I break them up and I draw free body diagrams of both the wedge right here uh, as well as the load that I'm doing over here. Uh, in general, you can neglect the weight of the wedge. It's going to be much smaller than the load. Generally, uh, wedges are there. So you can go ahead and neglect that. Okay. Uh, on this free body diagram, I've got my applied load, I've got my weight, and then a whole series of normal and friction forces acting between surfaces uh, throughout this uh, entire thing. Okay. And again, it's always going to oppose motion. So my P here is going to the right on the wedge. That means the friction force is heading to the left. Newton's third law flips F2 over here. Um, this wedge is going to move up, so there's a friction force down on the wall on the right. Okay. Now, generally the wedge is not going to tip. Okay. So we're not going to really have a moment equation when looking at the wedge. Okay. And there's really no way for the wedge to tip. So uh, basically, we only have two equations for each one of these. I have the sum of the forces in the x and y for both of these. Okay. Now, I have three normal forces, three friction forces, and one applied force. So I have seven unknowns, really only four equations for a problem like this. Okay. But the problem I'm usually trying to solve is, hey, how much force P is it going to take to get this thing to move? Right? How much is it going to take to overcome all of the friction? So basically, I set all of my frictions to the maximum friction force, mu S N. Okay, because it's going to have to slip everywhere to get this thing to move. So they're all at their maximum friction force. That gives me three more equations because I have three frictions. So that brings me up to seven total equations, including my equilibrium equation. So I can now solve my seven unknowns. Okay, so with any wedge problem, basically just treat it like a machine. Break it up into pieces. Draw your free body diagrams. Uh, you know, uh, generally, you won't have a moment equation, so you apply your force equations, and then you know, set all the frictions to their maximum uh, in order to figure out how much it's going to take to make it slip everywhere. Okay, So that's, that's how we deal with wedges. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is screws. Okay, And basically how a screw and what, what a screw does is you put a moment on the screw and it basically transmits an axial force. So take, for example, this jack over here on the right. right? If I spin the screw... Right? I can move my weight up and down uh, accordingly. Okay, So I'm transmitting that moment into an axial force to move my load up and down. Okay, So what a screw essentially is, is it's a cylinder with an inclined thread wrapped around the cylinder, like I have here. Okay, So my radius is R. I have this thread wrapped around. I can go ahead and I can unwrap that, and I get basically an inclined plane. I get a ramp. Okay. It has a height of L, which we call our lead, and that's basically the distance between two threads on my screw. Uh, and then it's got a length or a width of the circumference, which is 2 pi r, because again, that's one wrap around the screw. Okay. So to find the angle of the ramp, I can simply take the inverse tangent of the lead divided by the circumference. Okay. So now I can draw my free body diagram. I treat it just like that ramp with at an angle of theta. I've got my weight acting down, and I have m divided by r. That's the moment up here divided by the radius that it's located at. So it's essentially uh, the force that's trying to push it up the ramp. Okay, uh, And then I also have a normal force and a friction force opposing that. Now, if you remember in our discussion of friction, we have what's called the friction angle, Okay, which is the inverse tangent of my static friction force. Okay, uh, which is basically the combination of the friction force and the normal force to basically create a, a resistance or a reactive force R at that angle, which uh, is a friction angle. 
Okay. So this is my free body diagram. Okay. So now to figure out how much force or moment it's going to take to move it up the ramp, I just sum the forces in the X and Y, the horizontal and the vertical. So in the vertical, I'm sorry, in the horizontal direction, I have M divided by R, and then I have R, and then these two angles here, cosine of those two added together, the friction angle and the lead angle. Okay. In the Y direction, I have my weight acting down and then R up, cosine of those two angles added together to get the vertical component. So that's the sum of the forces in the X and the sum of the forces in the Y equal to zero. Solving for the moment, this is the moment required to tighten the screw or move the, you know, oppose the load, tighten the screw, uh, move the load up, push it up the ramp. That's what I'm looking at. That's the moment I'm looking at here. Uh, I find that to be the radius times the load or the clamping force or the tightening force or what have you times the tangent of the two angles added together, the lead angle and the friction angle. So that's how much moment's going to take to get that thing to start tightening or moving it up the ramp. Okay. Now, going the opposite direction, okay, there's two cases that we need to look at. The first is a self-locking case. And what do I mean by self-locking? Well, I mean that if I let go, if I put no moment on it, okay, uh, the the thing sticks. So if you think about a car jack, you jack it up on that screw, you let go of it, and it stays put. It would be very bad if it didn't, and it crashed down on top of who's ever underneath the car changing the oil or whatever. Okay, so if the friction angle is bigger than the lead angle, then that uh, is a self-locking screw. When I apply no moment, it just stays in static equilibrium. The friction is big enough to hold that thing up. Okay, okay, but then I do. Let's say I do want to lower the car off the jack, or after I've tightened down a clamp, I want to loosen it. Okay, and basically help that thing back down. I need to have a create a moment to overcome that. Now, I'm not going to rewrite the equations, but using those same equations, I can find that moment to loosen a self-locking screw to be uh, the radius times the load, okay, uh, times the tangent of the friction minus the lead angle. And you can see that angle comes in right here, which is the friction angle minus the theta angle. Again, and I have the... Um, that R vector, which is the normal plus the friction, I have to overcome that to get that thing to unscrew because my friction is bigger than my lead. Okay. The other case is I've got a slippery screw. Okay. So if I've got something where if I let go of it, it's going to crash back down, I may need to hold it. And the, the question is, is how much moments required to keep that thing basically from slipping back down the ramp. In this case, my friction angle is actually less than my lead angle. So actually R is still up and to the right. So I need to put my moment in the opposite direction simply just to hold it there. If I let go of R, this thing's going to slide right down the ramp. Okay. So in this case, the angle that I'm looking at is the difference of theta minus phi s or the lead minus the friction angle. Okay, because now the lead is bigger than that friction angle, and it's not a self-locking screw. Okay, you can remember the difference between these two because you always want a positive angle. So whichever one's bigger, you put that on the left side and you subtract off the smaller one. That's, that's kind of the, the shortcut in remembering uh, which way to go. Most often what we're looking at are these self-locking screws because we're talking about clamps. I mean, if, if a screw lets go of itself, uh, it's not really doing its job. So we're looking at how much is it going to take to loosen it to overcome the friction and move it back down the ramp.